Hello and welcome to Mr. Tompkins EdTech and a brand new series of videos aimed at helping you prepare for your GCSE mathematics exams. In this series I'll be giving a complete walkthrough of the GCSE mathematics practice papers to help you prepare for your exams this summer. Now there are not so many of these and you don't want to squander them so make sure you try the paper yourself first before you look at these solutions. This particular paper is AQA 2021, Paper 2, Foundation Tier. Check the front cover of your paper to make sure it's the same one. If it's not, have a look through the playlist linked above which includes all the GCSC Mass Video walkthroughs I've recorded so far. I'm busy recording all of the GCSC practice papers, so if the one you're looking for isn't there already, why not subscribe by clicking the big red button below and check back in a few days. Don't forget to click on the bell so that you'll get a notification when I upload the next paper. I'll put timestamps in the description below so you can choose to watch the whole thing through or you can click on the timestamp and jump to the particular question you need help with. If you have a question, check the comments below as someone else might have already asked the same thing. If it's a new question, leave it in the comments and I will try and answer all of them as soon as I can. Don't forget to mention which question on the paper you're referring to and try and be as specific as possible. Finally, if this video helps you with your revision, please give it a thumbs up. It will really help me out and why not share the link with your friends because they might need a helping hand too. Okay, let's get into it. Question one, circle the factor of 32. Well, a factor of a number is a number that divides into your number without giving a remainder. Uh, so you've got one choice, and one choice only. It's that one, it's 16. Because 32 divided by 16 is two. None of the others will divide into 32 without a remainder, so it's got to be 16. Question two, y is three more than x. Circle the correct equation. Uh, right, let's just go and decode this. Uh, y y is equals 3 more than x, x plus 3. Okay, so y is y, is means equals. So I've just spun um, 3 more than x round and rewrote it as x plus 3. Okay, so which one is that? That is that one there then, isn't it? Question three, circle the value of 0 0.15 as a fraction. Uh, well, remember that in decimal numbers, that's tenths, that's one hundredths, isn't it? So 0 0.15 is the same thing as 15 over 100, uh, which you could then cancel down. You could look at uh, uh, common factors, top and bottom. Both of those numbers divide by five, uh, and that's gonna give you three over 20. Now, if you struggle to, uh, to simplify fractions, Remember, you can just type them into your calculator and it will do it for you. Question four, here is a parallelogram. Circle the expression for the perimeter. Now the perimeter is the distance around the shape. So if you start in one corner of your shape and imagine walking all the way around it, so around there, around there, around there, and back to where you started from, then that is the perimeter, okay? So how far would we walk if we did this? Uh, well, let's just do that again. If we were walk, walked along here first, how long is that? Well, it's going to be the same as the one opposite, isn't it? Because opposite sides in a parallelogram are equal. So that would be W. And then down here would be the same as the one opposite. That would be S. And then along here is W again. And up here is S again. So all together then the perimeter is going to be that W plus the S plus the W plus the S, uh, which we could then just group together, group the W's together, group the S's together. That's going to give me 2W plus 2S. So it's that one there, isn't it? Question five, work out the value of A squared minus 4A when A is 10. So what we need to do here is we need to substitute this A equals 10 into where we see A in the expression here. Okay, now A actually appears in two places. So it's going to be appearing here in the squared term. So rather than having A squared, I'm going to have 10 squared. And rather than having 4A, I'm going to have four lots of 10. Okay, uh, now we've just got a bit mass problem really, order of operations, what do we do first? Uh, I'm going to square that 10 first, it's going to give me 100. Then I'm going to multiply the four and the 10, that's going to give me 40. And then finally, I'm going to do the subtraction. 
which is 60. So the answer is 60. Question six, 16 people are asked to name their favorite fruit juice. Here are the results. Apple, very popular at six. Grapefruit, not so popular at one. Orange, four. Mango, my favorite, five. Okay, so one of the people was picked at random. Work out the probability that their favorite juice was orange or mango. Okay, uh, so we're gonna do a probability question. Probability of orange or mango. Now, or in probability means add, so it means we need to work out the probability of orange plus the probability of mango. Or the other thing you do is you can just collect them both together under one fraction. So what's the probability of getting orange? I've got four out of a total of, uh, what's the total, 16 people. So that's going to be four sixteenths. And then mango, what's mango? Down here, that's five. So that's five sixteenths. So all together, that is nine sixteenths. Okay, or you could have just grouped those together to start with and put it over 16. That would also work. Okay, but it's nine sixteenths. Part B says on the grid, draw a bar chart to represent the results. Okay, so we need to have the fruits along the bottom and the, um, the frequency up the side then, I think. Okay, so let's just draw those on. So frequency is gonna go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six along the top. Let me just label that frequency. And then along the bottom, we're gonna have apple, break, grapefruit, orange, and mango. Now the bar shouldn't be touching on a bar chart. They should be separate. How many squares have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, so I can easily fit uh, a gap between. So I could do apple, grapefruit, orange, mango, like that, can't I? Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna do apple here, and then grapefruit, and then orange, and then mango. Okay. <laughs> Okay, there's, so there's my uh, completed graph. Okay, now things that you might lose marks for, uh, forgetting to label the axis. So I've got frequency that side, I should have uh, favorite juice along the bottom. Okay, so labeling your axes is important. Uh, making sure your scale is even. You start on zero, so getting this bit right. Uh, making sure you've got a gap between your uh, bars along the bottom. Okay, that's important with your axes as well. And obviously plotting the heights at the right um, heights with a ruler. Okay, if you've done all those things, then you're going to get all the marks. Question seven, six cakes cost £10.74. Work out the cost of 11 of these cakes. Now I'm going to set this out as a ratio problem because uh, I think it lends itself quite well uh, to this. So I've got the ratio of cakes to costs. Okay, so I know that there are six cakes to 10.74. Okay, so that's the cost of six cakes. Now I want to know what the cost of 11 cakes is. Okay, so if I can work out the number that goes there next to it, then I'm done, aren't I? Okay, now uh, I'm gonna be using something called the unitary method which is going via the number one, okay? So if I've got six cakes, uh, to go from six to one as a ratio, I need to divide by six, and then to go from one to 11, I need to times by 11, okay? Now, what I do to one side of a ratio, I've got to do to the other, so dividing by six, and then times in by 11 should give me the answer that I'm looking for. So taking 10.74, dividing it by six, uh, that gives me one pound 79. Don't really need to write that one in actually, but hey ho. And then times it by 11, I'm gonna get 19 
pounds 69 and that's my answer then uh, the cost of 11 cakes then is going to be 19 pounds and 69 pence question eight here is a cuboid yes there is uh, work out the volume okay do you know the volume formula for a cuboid volume equals length times width times height so what's the length what's the width times what's the height that's got to be the length that's the width there, that's got to be the height there, isn't it? It doesn't actually matter which order they go in, you just got to multiply them all together anyway. So what is eight times five times six then? Uh, five, six of 30, eight lots of 30 is 240. I think I can probably do that faster than on a calculator, just, just double check, 240, yeah. Okay, so that is 240 centimeters cubed. Question nine, work out two numbers that are multiples of nine and have a difference of 54. Okay, so with these sorts of questions, what I try to do is I try to generate at least some numbers and then do a bit of trial improvement to try and work out what the correct answer is. So I'm gonna start with this one, multiples of nine. What are the possible numbers? So this will give me some possible values for my two numbers. If I just start listing multiples of nine, nine, 18, 27, 36, basically every number in the nine times table, 45, 54, so but remember it's the difference of 54, uh, 63, 72, 81, 90, okay? So my two numbers need to come from that list or maybe further along it. Uh, now the next part says has a difference of 54. Now a difference in mathematics means subtract. Okay, so they've got to be at least 54 apart. Okay, so what about if I picked 9 and, well not, obviously not 54, because but one more than 54, 63. Is that, has that got a difference of... 54, I think it does, isn't it? 63 minus 9, that is 54. Okay, so that is one pair that works. So I could pick 9 and 63. Okay, now you could add a whole host of other ones. Uh, in fact, you could have had any pair after that. So like 18 and 72 would work, 27 and 81 would work, uh, and so on, and 36 and 90 would have worked as well. So uh, there are lots and lots of solutions to this. It just asks for uh, one solution. It doesn't want all of them. So we're done, let's move on. Question 10, convert 11.2 kilometers into miles. And we've got to use eight kilometers equals five miles. There's a bit of a weird conversion factor here, but uh, once you've done a couple of these, it's fairly straightforward. So if I take 11.2, I want to convert that using eight kilometers is five miles. Okay, so what we need to do is divide by this one to find out how many lots of eight kilometers there are in our answer and then multiply by this one. Okay, so we're basically going to be dividing by eight and times in by five. Okay, so that's going to be basically five eighths of my answer then. I'm going to divide by the eight to find out how many blocks of eight kilometers are in 11.2 and then multiply that result by five and that will tell me the answer that I'm looking for. So 11.2 times 5 over 8 is 7, okay? Question 11, Annie spends these amounts in four shops using £20 notes, £10 notes and £5 notes. Uh, so shop A, 65, shop B, 40, shop C, 115 and shop D, 75. In each shop, she pays the exact amount, uses the smallest possible number of notes, work out the total number of each note she uses. Okay, so she can use 20 tens and five. So if she wants to use the fewest number of notes, she's gonna to have to use the biggest number, the biggest denomination note she can. Okay, so if we have a look at shop uh, A, where she spent 65 pounds, we're not going to be using six tens because we can do it in three lots of 20. So we're gonna try and use as many of the bigger notes as we can. So the first thing we're going to see is how many £20 notes fit in and then find out what's left, see what how many £10 notes go in that and see what's left and find out how many £5. Okay, I might just do it as a like a little add-on table onto the edge of my existing table. So I kind of just draw a little extension to my table. Oh, didn't quite fit very nice. So 
So then this is going to be the number of 20s, this is going to be the number of 10s, and this is going to be the number of 5s then. Right, so for shop A, 65 pounds, I can, I can do that in three 20 pound notes, that'll give me 60, zero 10s, and one 5 then, won't it? Okay, that'll give me 65 pounds. Shop B, I just need two 20 pound notes, none of the rest. Shop C, I could do five 20 pound notes, that's 100 plus one of those, that's 110, plus one of those, which is 115. And then finally, in shop D, uh, I could use three 20 pound notes, that would take me up to 60. Uh, one 10 takes me to 70, and one five takes me to 75. Okay, so what is, uh, what's the total there then? So 20 pound notes, I need three, two, five, and three, that adds up to 13, I want 13 of those. Two 10 pound notes, and three five pound notes, that's, that's what I need. 13, 2, and 3. Question 12. A sports team played 40 games. Half were home games and half were away games. Each game was a win, a draw, or a loss. Of the home games, two-fifths were losses. Of the away games, one-tenth were wins. Complete the frequency tree. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to go through this line by line and then add whatever we can add to the frequency tree as we go along. And then hopefully by the end, it will all be complete. So a sports team has played 40 games. Well, that's already on there. That's the total number of games here, isn't it? Okay. Uh, then the next line says half were home games and half were away games. Notice no numbers. That's just words. So read the words. Words are important. Right. So uh, half were home games, half were away games. Well, half of 40 is 20. And half of, of 40 is also 20. So 40 home and 40 away games. Okay. Right. Uh, so each game was either a win, a draw, or a loss. And they're already marked on there. Don't have to do anything with that. Uh, of the home games, two-fifths were losses. Of the home games, two-fifths were losses. So that line, the green line, gave me that. Of the home games, two-fifths were losses. Uh, what is two-fifths of 20? We had 20 home games. What's two-fifths of 20? So 20 times two-fifths, multiplying by a fraction, you kind of divide by the number on the bottom, times or by the number at the top, don't you? So 20 divided by five is four, four times by two is eight. You can do this on a calculator as well if you, if you wanted to. Right, so that tells me that there were eight losses then for the home games. Now notice the number of wins is already in the table, there's seven. So we've accounted for seven games that were wins, eight games that were losses. That's a total of seven plus eight, that's 15 games accounted for. Okay, now there's only one other option, which is that they drew. So the remaining five of those 20 games have got to be draws, so I can also fill in that number there, okay? So those two I got from the blue bit of text. And then finally, of the away games, one-tenth were wins. Of the away games, one-tenth were wins. Okay, so what is one-tenth then of 20? Because remember, there were 20 away games as well. What is one-tenth of that? Well, 20 divided by 10 is 2. So that means that they had two away wins. Notice they've already given us the losses here. So again, we've got two wins, 12 losses. That's, that means we've got 14 out of our 20 that are accounted for. So that leaves 20 minus 14. That leaves six games unaccounted for. So they must be the draws there then, okay? So we got those from the pink bit of text. So, you know, just going through carefully through the text, reading it line by line, we should be able to populate the whole thing uh, without too much problem, okay? Good, let's move on. Question 13, factorize fully 50x plus 100. Um, when it says factorize fully, it normally means there's more than one factor, but I only really see one factor in here, but perhaps it's there because it's possible to miss the largest common factor of those two numbers. Uh, so for instance, if you brought out 10, because 10 goes into 50 and 10 goes into 100, and wrote 5x plus 10, that would only be partially factorized because you've missed... Um, a bigger factor that you could have pulled out. So the biggest factor of 50 and 100 is actually 50, isn't it? So that's what needs to come out to the front. And what does that leave inside the brackets? 50 times what is 50x? It's x. And 50 times what is 100? It's 50 times 2. So it's 50 lots of x plus 2. That is what you get when you fully factorize that expression. 
Question 14, some buttons are red or blue in the ratio red to blue is three to five. So what fraction of the buttons are red? Circle your answer. Okay, so you've got red buttons of which there are three and you've got blue buttons of which there are five. Now when you do a ratio, you compare what you've got with what you don't have. So the ratio of red buttons to blue buttons is the three red buttons we've got plus the five blue buttons that, that are not red. So you kind of compare what you have with what you don't have. Now in a fraction though, you compare what you have with the total. Okay, so how many buttons are there all together? Well, if you've got three red ones and five blue ones, then all together you've got three plus five, you've got eight buttons. So when you're writing something down as a fraction, uh, you have the total number of things on the bottom, which is eight, isn't it? Okay, uh, so uh, what fraction are red? Well, there were three red buttons out of a total of eight buttons. So the ratio of three to five is equivalent to three apes uh, red. And of course, you could have five apes blue as well. But we only want the three apes, so we're done. Question 15. Which of these uh, is a correct statement for a cube? It has 12 edges, it has 12 faces, it has 12 planes. It has 12 vertices. Okay, well... The vertices, let's start at the bottom list and work our way to the top uh, and just talk about what these things are. So the vertices of a cube are the corners. Now if you count the corners of the cube, you've got one, two, three, four on the top, plus you've got one, two, three, four on the bottom. You've got that kind of one in the corner there that you can't see, uh, giving you a total of eight vertices. So there are eight of those, so that isn't right. Uh, Twelve planes, planes? I don't know what even they mean by planes. It makes no sense, that one. A plane is um, it's like a, a, a two-dimensional slice through your through your cube. There's got an infinite number of those. Okay, there's an actually infinite number of, of planes that go through there. So I don't think that's um, that's the one. Faces, how many faces this, uh, does a cube have? Well, if you think about a dice, it's numbered one through six, isn't it? It's actually got six faces. Uh, uh, so it's not that one. Uh, edges, does it have 12 edges? Well, let's have a look. So you've got one, two, these are the edges, three, four. Uh, along the, at the top there, you've got one, two, three, four. Along the bottom, you've got one, two, three, four, kind of going that way. So four, four, and four then, which does it indeed add up to 12. So there are 12 edges on a cube. Good to know. Question 16, AB is parallel to CD. FG is a straight line, work out the size of angle X. Okay, so angle X is over here. It's a good idea not to just kind of overly focus on the thing you wanna find with these first. Uh, just kind of get a sense of the problem and what you know and what you can find with it. And then hopefully the answer will fall out along the way. Uh, so just look at the top here. It says AB is parallel to CD. I'm just going to highlight our parallel lines. These are my pair of parallel lines. Uh, and then FG is a straight line. This is what we call a transversal. It's the line crossing your pair of parallel lines. Okay. And when you get a line crossing your pair of parallel lines, it creates a number of angles that are related to each other. Uh, so for instance, this angle here, the 53, is going to be the same as this angle over here, which we call the corresponding angle. So that one is also uh, 53. It's the same as that one over there. Uh, so I can mark that one as 53. Now, you can probably see then I've got three angles, 53x and 48. These are all falling on a straight line, aren't they? Okay, so these three angles need to add up to 180. So I can say then that 53 plus X plus the 48, they've got to be 180 because they are angles on a straight line. Uh, so what are those two angles that I know? I've got 53 and 48, I can add those together. 53 plus 48, 50 plus 40 is 90, three plus eight is 11, so it's gonna be 101, isn't it? X plus 101 is equal to 180. Uh, Taking 101 away from both sides, this side there cancel, leaves you with X. 
180 take away 101 that's going to be uh, 80 take away one it's 79 isn't it so 79 degrees we're done 79 Question 17, Harry and his sister Jess have some money uh, in the ratio of Harry to Jess of 1 to 4. Uh, Harry has £7.35. Uh, they pay £16.99 for a present for a friend. Harry used, uh, uses a third of his money, just pays the rest. Uh, how much money does Jess have left? Oh, okay. I don't know. Let's find out. Let's go through this line by line because there's quite a lot going on here. So I've got the ratio of Harry to Jess, which is 1 to 5. Let me just make a note of that down here. So Harry to Jess is 1 to 4. Uh, but we're then told that Harry has £7.35. So that means that this is his one share is worth £7.35. So what is Jess's amount then? So if you think about... How, what you have to multiply 1 by to get £7.35. I have to multiply it up by £7.35. Okay, so if I do the same thing on this side, it means that uh, Jess must have four lots of £7.35. What is four lots of £7.35? Calculator. £7.35 times four, please. Uh, that comes to £29.40. So that means Jess has got £29.40. pence. Okay, so they pay sixteen ninety nine for a present for a friend. Harry uses one third of his money, so Harry pays uh, one third of his money. So he's got seven pound thirty five, and he uses a third of it. So times that by a third, or basically dividing it by three, isn't it? Another way of thinking about it. So seven point three five divided by three, uh, he must pay two pound forty five towards the cost of £2.45. So then Jess pays the rest. So Jess pays, so the present costs £16.99. Uh, Harry put in £2.45. So if I take £2.45 away from £16.99, it will give me the bit that um, Jess had to pay. So just typing that into my calculator, that tells me it's £14.54. Okay, so that's Jess's contribution, £14.54. Uh, but that, that's not the question. The question is, um, how much money does Jess have left? Okay, so now we need to work out what she's got left of her money then. So uh, Jess remaining. That's going to be the money she had in total. Remember that was uh, £29.40, wasn't it? So she had £29.40 to start with. And then I'm going to take away uh, the amount that she spent on the present, which was £14.54. So minus £14.54. Okay, so that's where that one came from. And that's where that one came from. Uh, and then we're just going to take one away from the other. And that should be the amount she has left then. So 29.4 minus £14.54, that leaves her with £14.86. So she's still doing all right on the cash front. Question 18, 10x minus 3 is equal to 21. We need to solve it. Okay, so let's start with the equation. 10x minus 3 is equal to 21. Now, when we're solving linear equations, we have to kind of work through bid mass backwards. So bid mass backwards, okay? So because we're kind of unwinding it, aren't we? We're not actually working out this equation. We're trying to unwind it and get x by itself, okay? Now, in here, I have got a subtraction and I've got a multiplication, okay? I've got a subtract three and I've got a, uh, a multiply by 10 to my value of x. Now, if you have a look at bid mass, then subtraction comes right at the end uh, and multiplication comes in the middle. So if I was working this out, I would do the multiplication first and I would do the subtraction. But as I'm unwinding it, I'm going to deal with the subtraction first and then the multiplication. So the opposite of subtracting 3 is adding 3. So I'm going to add 3 to both sides. Uh, they'll cancel, and it will leave me with 10x on the left. On the right, I've got 21 and 3. That makes 24. Okay. 
so now I've got 10x equals 24. I want to get x is equal to something, so now I'm going to deal with that times in by 10. Uh, so the opposite of times in by 10 is dividing by 10. So I'm going to divide both sides by 10. They'll cancel. And it's going to leave you with x on the left. 24 divided by 10, that's 2.4, isn't it? So that's my answer, x is equal to 2.4. Question 19, work out which of these fractions is closer in value to 0 0.5. Is it 5 sixteenths? Is it 17 25ths? Now, comparing fractions is always a bit of a nightmare. Uh, and the reason for that is they've got different size pieces that are made out of. This is made out of pieces of size 16. This is made out of pieces of size 25. Uh, so in order to kind of compare them uh, in any way, um, the easiest thing is to find a common denominator of those two numbers first. So what is a common denominator of 16 and 25 then? Okay, can you think of a number they both go into? Um, well, you can always find one if you multiply them together, but that is often bigger than it needs to be. 16 times 24 is 400, but there might be a smaller one. Uh, like, for instance, 200. Can 16 go into 200? 200 divided by 16, that does, doesn't fit. So maybe, maybe 400 is the lowest common multiple. Um, I think about it, 16 is 2 to the 4, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 25 is 5 squared. So they don't have anything in common, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the, the smallest thing that they both go into is going to be 400. Okay, so rewriting this as fractions over 400, then um, 16 goes into 425 times. So if I multiply this by 25, that's going to give me um, 125 on the top then. So that's 125 four hundredths. Uh, and then the other one, I'm going to multiply top and bottom by 16 uh, to give me four hundredths. Uh, and so 17 times 16 comes out to be 272. Okay, so one seems to be one side of, of the halfway point and one is the other. Uh, how many four hundredths is, is 0 0.5? Okay, so remember we've got 0 0.5, we want to see which is closest. So if I want to compare 0 0.5 with these, uh, then that's going to be 5 tenths, which is... So that's going to be 5 tenths, which if I multiply top and bottom by 40, I'm going to get 200 over 400. Okay, so that's the middle value. So which one is closest to 200 over 400? Now, the difference between 125 and 200, 200 take away 125, that's 75. It's got a difference of 75. Uh, 272 minus uh, take away 200, they've got a difference of 72. So I think that one is closest. Okay, so... So that one is closer, okay? So two, so that's uh, 17 over 25 is my final answer then. 17 over 25 is closest. Okay, so I've showed my working. I've showed that I've, I've compared them all to, as fractions over 400. It's all good. All right, let's move on. Question 20A. Point B is 400 meters northeast of point A. Mark point B on the centimeter grid. Use a scale of one centimetre represents 100 metres. Now I'm going to struggle a little bit getting this one totally accurate because I'm working virtually on a virtual exam paper and I have a virtual ruler which has got virtual marks on it and no numbers and probably doesn't match up with reality. Okay, so I'm going to struggle. You might struggle as well, by the way, if you're working on a printout of your exam paper. Um, then depending on how your school or you printed it, you might find the grid that you've got there doesn't actually uh, make one centimeter as well. So probably what you want to do is just measure and double check. If you're working on a duplicated paper, just make sure that your number of divisions between there and there is one centimeter. You can see mine isn't. I've got six divisions. Oh joy! So I'm going to have to kind of bear that in mind when I'm when I'm working. 
Okay, but I think I can do a reasonable enough explanation even with my virtual things here. Okay, so point B is 400 meters northeast of point A. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure off in that direction in a minute. Okay, but how far do I need to go? Uh, now I've got a scale here of one centimeter represents 100 meters. So I could write that as a ratio of one centimeter to 100 meters. Now I want this to be 400 meters over here, which is a hundred, well, four times bigger than my original scale. So if I multiply this side up by four as well, I'm going to get um, four. Four centimeters represents 400 meters. So I need to go four centimeters off in this direction. Now my scale was a little bit out because of the reasons I just told you about a second ago. Uh, and there was actually six little divisions on my ruler that match with the paper. So I'm going to go up 24 little divisions, which isn't quite right, uh, but will match probably what the real diagram should look like. So it should end up a little bit beyond there, I would say. Okay, so a little bit into, it's gone straight across the first square, the second square, and point B is a little bit into the third square up here. Okay, so you'd expect your point B to be somewhere similar if you'd use the right measurement with the right size grid. Okay, so that's where it should be. So you should measure four centimeters along here with your real life ruler and it should all be good. Oh, I forgot to say why uh, I was going off in that direction. Uh, the direction they give you is northeast. And if you, you know, if you know your scales, never eat shredded wheat. Uh, then you know that northeast is between uh, north and east. It's off in that direction there. Part B says points C and D are shown on a different centimeter grid, uh, and the scale this time is one to a thousand. Work out the bearing of D from C. Well, the bearing of D from C. That means we are going from C. We are leaving C, and we are going to D. Okay. So if you think about it, we are going directly southwards from C down to D. Okay, we're going in this direction. Okay, now that is the opposite direction to north. Uh, it's south, but we're not asked for, you know, a compass direction. We're asked for a bearing. Now, bearings are normally given as three, uh, three digits. Uh, and it is an angle measured clockwise from north. Okay, so if if north is, n north is zero, 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 then east is zero, nine, zero, uh, 90 degrees beyond north, and then south then is, so that's east, then south is gonna be another 90 degrees, that's gonna be one, eight, zero. Okay, so that is the bearing then of D from C, it's on a bearing of one, eight, zero. Part C says work out the actual distance in meters of D from C. Okay, so you can see, hopefully, this grid is one centimeter. I can see then counting, just counting down in centimeters from here to here. That's one, two, three centimeters, isn't it? Okay, so if the scale is one to a thousand, and we have got three actual centimeters, then that is equivalent to 3,000 centimeters in reality but this does not want centimeters it wants it in meters okay so my answer is 3000 centimeters but there are 100 centimeters in every one meter so to convert that into meters i'm going to have to divide it by a hundred okay so how many hundreds in 3000 there are 30 aren't they so that is 30 meters. Question 21. Lynn works as a bus driver. She is paid £10.80 per hour for the first 38 hours that she works and she's paid 25% more per hour for each extra hour she works. One week Lynn was paid £491.40. In total how many hours did she work that week? You must show your working. Okay so she she gets a basic salary of £10.80 per hour for the first 38 hours and then any other hour after that she gets like uh, overtime rate which is 25% more per hour 
Okay, so that's the information that we're going to go with. What's her basic pay then? So her basic weekly pay, her basic weekly pay, that's going to be her uh, normal 38 hours multiplied her by her normal pay rate of £10.80. So in a normal week, if she's got no overtime, uh, she's going to be earning 38 lots of £10.80. Uh, that comes out to be uh, 410 pounds and 40 pence. Uh, don't forget it's pounds and pence. Uh, so we write down two zeros. Don't just write 0.4. That would be wrong. Okay, so basic weekly pay is 410 pound 40. Now you can see that she actually earned 491 pound. So the difference then between her basic weekly pay and her actual weekly pay is going to be her overtime. Okay, so uh her overtime pay so overtime pay overtime is the time you work over your normal hours and overtime pay is going to be the amount of money you earn over your normal amount that you earn so 491 pound 40 minus 410 pounds 40 uh you can see then her overtime pay is uh take away 49 1.4 that comes out to be 81 She's got £81 in overtime pay, okay? Now, so we know how much overtime pay she got. Uh, now we need to work out how many hours she worked extra in order to earn those £81. Now, what is her overtime rate? Her overtime rate is 25% more per hour than uh, what she normally works. So her overtime rate is how much she gets paid per hour is going to be um, her normal pay, £10.80, uh, with a 25% extra. So that's a 25% increase. Uh, so I don't know if you've seen this triangle before. F O M, put your thumb on it. F O M equals, equals, equals. Final is what we're looking for. We want to know what, what the amount is after we do our percentage change. Original is what we started with, is £10.80. Uh, multiplier. Now, when you're doing a percentage increase, you always start with 100%. We're going to be adding on 25% because that's how much extra she gets paid for her overtime. That comes to 125%, which is a decimal, or uh, as a multiplier, is 1.25. Okay. So what we want, we want to work out the final. Uh, so I'll stick my thumb on that. That tells me what to do with the other two. It's original times multiplier, isn't it? So it's going to be, um, just do this properly, original times multiplier, uh, which is um, £10.80 times by 1.25. What does that come out to be? So £10.80 times 1.25, that means that she earns £13.50 for each overtime hour that she works. Okay, so that's the amount that she uh, gets paid per hour. So we now know her hourly overtime rate, plus we know um, what she got paid for her overtime. So dividing one by the other, we should she would we should be able to work out the number of overtime hours that she worked. So overtime hours. Now notice all the way down. I'm kind of writing little statements about what it is I'm going to find. It just makes uh, your work easier to read by the examiner and actually easier to read by you. You know, often I look at these questions or I mark them from students, and you get like crazy multiplication and adding going up all over the place um, but with just these kind of simple little uh, sentence half sentences explaining what you're doing each step makes it a lot easier for the examiner to mark your work meaning they're more likely to gift you the mark and secondly uh, when you come through to check your own work a bit later on the exam if you've got a bit of free time you can actually understand all the things you've been doing as well okay so just a top tip Doing that is actually quite a useful thing. So overtime hours is going to be the total amount of overtime, 81, divided by the, the overtime rate of £13.50. So how many times does 13 50 go into 81? 81 divided by answer, 6. Goes in 6 times. So that means she, she did 6 hours overtime. 
okay, on top of her normal hours. Okay, so how many hours did she work? So total hours then is going to be her 38 normal hours plus her 6 hours of overtime, giving you a total of 44 hours. Okay, so quite a long question, that one. Quite a lot of steps to it. Uh, but hopefully you uh, you followed it through. As long as you're systematic, you can bang out all of those five marks. Question 22. The square root of x is 4. Circle the value of x squared. Okay, now take care here. Don't rush. Because uh, you might just be thinking it's 16. It isn't. Square root of x is 4. So if the square root of x is 4, what's x? Now to get uh, x from the square root of x, we're going to have to do the opposite of square root, which is squaring. Okay, so if I take x uh, square root of x and I square it, I get x. If I take the uh, 4 and I square it, I'm going to get 16. Now we actually want the value of x squared, so then we need to go and square again, don't we? So that's going to be 16 squared. What's 16 squared? I think it's probably the 256. Let's just double check. 16 squared, 256. So it'd be that one there. Question 23, here is a rule for a sequence. After the first two terms, each term is the sum of the previous two terms. Okay, well I know what sort of sequence that is. That's uh, a Fibonacci sequence, isn't it? That's the rule for a, a Fibonacci type sequence, where you get the next term by adding the two previous ones together. Uh, we're told that the first five terms are P, 23, Q, 57, and R work out the values of p, q, and r. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to form a bunch of equations in p, q, and r that we can hopefully solve. Now, first up, uh, if I take two terms and I add them together, it gives me the next term. Okay, so that tells me that p plus 23 must be equal to q. Okay, so that's one. Uh, and then I can do the same thing for the next two terms. So I, I know that those two terms added together gives me that one. So I also know that uh, 23 plus Q is equal to 57. Okay. And then, what else do I know? I also know that Q plus 57 must be equal to R. Okay, so I've got equation 1, equation 2, equation 3. Now, in those three equations, I've got three unknowns. I've got P appearing here. Uh, I've got Q appearing here, here, and here. And I've got R appearing here. Now, notice equation 1 and equation 3 have got two unknowns in. Uh, so that makes it really difficult to find them. If you've, if you've got more than one unknown, you can't actually find them. Uh, but equation 2 has just got one unknown in it. It's just got Q in it. So uh, my feeling is we're going to use equation 2 first to find Q. Once I know what Q is, then I can go back to the other two and find P and R. Okay? That's the plan. So let's take equation... Uh, 2 to start with. So from 2, we know that uh, 23 plus Q is equal to 57. So if I take 23 away from both sides, look, they are going to cancel, just leaving me with Q on the left. Uh, Q is equal to 57 take away 23. What's that, 34? So now I know what Q is. Q is 34. I can substitute Q equals 34 into one of the other equations and work out the other things. So let's, let's put it into equation 1 first. Uh, so that tells me then that P plus 23 is equal to Q, which is 34. Okay, and then taking 20, 23 away from both sides again, I'm going to get P is equal to 11. So now I know P as well. And now if I also substitute into equation 3, what do I get? I'm going to get uh, Q, which I know is 34, plus 57. That is equal to R. So what's 34 plus 57? Uh, that is equal to, what, 87, 91? 91. 
R. Okay, so they're my three values. So I know that P is 11, I know that Q is 34, and I know that R is 91. All done. Question 24, here's triangle ABC. Assume that angle ACB is 90, work out the length of AB. So assume that ACB is 90, where's that then? ACB, ACB, it's that angle there then in that corner. That's the one we're after. That, so we're gonna assume that's the right angle. Probably later on we're gonna assume, we're gonna find out it isn't, but let's assume it is for now. Work out the length of AB, so I want this side along here. This is the one I'm after, AB. Okay, so I want the longest side of a right angle triangle, allegedly. Uh, and I know the other two sides. This is a job for Pythagoras theorem, isn't it? So using Pythagoras theorem, I know that C squared equals A squared plus B squared. That's what I've remembered. C is always the longest side. A and B are the other two. It doesn't really matter which way around you do it. So then our longer side, C squared, is equal to A, 7 squared, plus B, 15 squared. Okay, so I need to square those two, add them together, and then square root, I shall find C. So 7 squared plus 15 squared, that comes to 274. So then C is going to be the root of that, root answer. Don't forget to square root. That comes out to be 16 point, I'm gonna round that up to 16.6 .6 centimeters. Now, whenever you're doing any question like this, it's always a good idea just to think about how sensible your answer looks. Now, if I took this answer here and I put it at there where the C is, does that look right? Does that look like 16.6 .6 centimeters? Have a look at the others. I've got 15 and seven. 16.6 .6 looks sensible, uh, that's the longest side, so I'm expecting it to be a bit longer than 15. Okay, so it looks all right there. Now, if I'd have forgotten to square root and just wrote down 274, then 274 would have looked ridiculous there. Uh, so just, you know, having to think before you move on, does my answer look sensible at the end of every question will save you a lot of silly mistakes during the exam. Okay, just a top tip there. Uh, let's move on. Part B says the actual length of AB is greater than the answer to part A. What does this mean about the angle ACB? Okay, so we thought it was going to be 16.6, uh, .6, didn't we? Okay, we, th we worked out it should be 16.6. .6. But if, if this one gets longer, if it gets longer, then uh, it's going to stretch this angle out, isn't it? This angle is going to get wider. It has to be because these two other lengths stay the same. So if this side stays the same and this one stays the same, but this one gets longer, uh, then necessarily that, that angle down there is going to widen out, okay? So if AB is greater than 16.6 .6 or what we thought it was, then that angle down there can't be a right angle anymore. It's got to be more than 90. So we know for sure it's got to be more than 90 degrees. Question 25, rearrange G equals 3H minus 1 to make H the subject. Now, these are actually, I, I don't know, students worry about these, but actually they, they solve exactly the same way as solving a linear equation. So uh, if you knew how, how to find the value of H, you know, if um, if you had, I don't know, 16 equals 3h minus 1. If you could if you could work out what h was, if you know how to solve linear equations, then it just works exactly the same way here. It's just going to be rearranging exactly the same way. Now, when we were doing the linear equation earlier, I said what we had to do was use bid mass backwards. So bid mass backwards. Okay, that's what we're going to be doing. And it's the same thing here because they solve exactly the same way. And similar to the one earlier, we've got a subtraction to do to deal with and a multiplication. Subtraction comes right at the last thing, and multiplication becomes in the middle. So if we were evaluating this, we'd do the multiplication first and then the subtraction. But if we're rearranging or solving, we're kind of unwinding the equation. We're going to go through it backwards. So we're going to deal with that subtraction first and then the multiplication. Okay, so let's deal with the subtraction first. The opposite of taking one away, that is adding one. So if I add one to both sides, that will cancel. 
leave you three H on the right. On the left, I'm gonna get G plus one. Okay, so I'm gonna get G plus one is equal to three H. Okay, and then I can deal with that multiplication, multiplying by three. Now the opposite of multiplying by three is dividing by three. So I'm gonna divide both sides by three, that will cancel. Uh, and that will leave me with H on the right. On the left, I'm just going to get G plus 1 all over 3. Okay, so that is my thing, except I've got H at the back rather than at the front. So I'm just going to flip this around and say, well, that's the same thing as H is equal to G plus 1 over 3. Okay, just write the H at the front and the G plus 1 over 3 at the back. Okay. No worries, we're done. Describe fully the single transformation that uh, maps triangle ABC to triangle ADE. Uh, now just take care of the way around this goes. We are mapping the big triangle ABC onto the little triangle, aren't we? Okay, not the other way around. Uh, it's clearly an enlargement, uh, but because you're going from the big one to the small one, it's going to be an enlargement with a fractional uh, scale factor. Okay, so I'm going to write down that it's an enlargement. Now, with an enlargement, we need to state two things. We need to know the scale factor, which we think is going to be a fraction, because it's, it's kind of a reduction rather than an enlargement. And we need to know the center of enlargement. Now, I can, I can spot that already. Um, but if you're not sure where it is, what you can do is you can take matching points on object and image. Uh, and this point here would match up with this one and this point here would match up with this one and you can join them up with straight lines and that will pass through your center of enlargement uh, which you should spot ends up being the point A doesn't it okay but actually I spotted that straight away because A maps to A okay so if it if it's an enlargement and a point maps to itself, then that point has to be the center of enlargement. Anyway, that's the only point that doesn't move in an enlargement uh, is the point on the center itself. So you should be able to spot that A is the center of the enlargement of this shape, okay? So this is an enlargement center point A, which has coordinates uh, three, nine. And what is the scale factor? Okay, well, if, if we find matching lengths on object and image, it's probably easiest to use this one. Look, this one here is four units. This one here goes from half to half, doesn't it? It's actually one unit. Okay, so it's a quarter of the size. So the scale factor is going to be one quarter. All right. So enlargement center, uh, three nine, scale factor of a quarter. A ball contains 5,000 cubic centimeters of air. More air is pumped into the ball at a rate of 160 cubic centimeters per second. The ball is full of air when it becomes a sphere with radius 15 centimeters. Uh, we've been given the volume of a sphere formula. It's 4 thirds pi r cubed, although probably it's easy, just as easy to remember that, uh, where r is the radius. Does it take less than one minute to fill the ball? You must show all your work in. Okay, so what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to find the volume of air inside the ball when it's fully inflated. Uh, and we're going to then see how much extra air was put in. Uh, and then we can use that to work out how much time that took. And then we can see if that amount of time is less than a minute or not. And that's my kind of plan of action. Okay, so uh, let's find the max volume of the ball then. So maximum volume. Uh, we were told the maximum volume occurred when the radius of the sphere was 15 centimeters. So the max volume is going to be 4 thirds pi r cubed when r is 15 then, isn't it? So that's 4 thirds of pi times uh, 15 cubed. Okay, uh, so what's that? Just going to do the number part for now. I'm just going to leave it in terms of pi. I'll do that on the final calculation. So what's 15 cubed times 4 divided by 3? That's 4,500. So I'm just going to leave it as 4,500 pi. 
if I multiply it pi by pi here, I would just have like a decimal that I had to use all the way through and I'd lose more accuracy. So it's better to leave it as an exact value like that for now. Okay, so then uh, the ball contains 5,000 cubic centimeters of air to start with. So then the change or the amount of air put in, um, so the air added, is going to be the difference between 4,500 pi minus that 5,000 cubic centimeters that was already there. Okay, uh, so that's how much air was added. Again, I'm just going to leave it like that for now because, uh, yeah, pi. Uh, and then what's next? I know that air was going in at 160 cubic centimeters per second. So time taken then, time taken is going to be that 4500 zero, zero, pi minus 5000 over uh, 160 then, isn't it? Okay, and that tell me the number of seconds. Now I am going to work it out with the pi this time because this is my final calculation. So 4500 4, lots of pi minus 5000 uh, and then that divided by 160. Okay, that comes to 57.1 on my calculator to three significant figures. So that's 57.1 watt seconds. Okay. Does it take less than a minute to fill the ball? Uh, yes. Yes, it does. Yes. It takes 57.1 seconds, which is less than a minute. Okay, so I'm done. P is a positive number, N is a negative number. For each statement, tick the correct box. Okay, and I've got an always true, sometimes true, and never true for each statement. They all got a bit wonky when I printed them out for some reason, uh, but basically there's one box for each, isn't there? Let's have a look at the first one. Uh, P plus N is positive. Is that always true? Is that sometimes true? Is that never never true? Uh, well, I think with these, it's sometimes it's helpful to have um, some test values. Uh, so if I let P equal um, 2, say, and I let N equal 3, then I can see that if I added those, sorry, minus 3, because N is negative, uh, so if I had uh, P is 2 and N is negative 3, then uh, 2 plus negative 3, that is a negative number, isn't it? Okay. However, if I'd have picked 3 plus negative 2, then that would be 1. Okay. So for that one, uh, you sometimes get a positive number when you add P and N together, uh, but you don't always you sometimes get negative ones. So that one is sometimes true. What about P, e, uh, P minus N? Is that always positive? Well, using the same numbers, look, two minus negative three, th those two minus would become a plus, and that would be five. Uh, three minus negative two, that would also be five. Is that always true? Does it matter? Okay, well, Taking away a negative is always positive, isn't it? So this becomes like a positive number plus another positive number. And that is always going to be a positive number. Okay, so I think that one is always true. P squared plus N squared, is that always positive? Uh, so again, with our test values, 2 squared plus negative 3 squared. Uh, that's going to be positive, isn't it? Because 2 squared is 4, negative 3 squared is 9. Add them together, you're going to get um, 13. So that's positive. If I had um, 3 squared and I added on negative 2 squared, another example, that's the same value. Uh, because when you square a negative, you always get a positive, don't you? Okay, so a negative squared is always positive. And again, we're going to have a positive plus a positive. And that is always then going to be a positive. Okay, so that one is also always true. P cubed divided by N cubed. Okay, hmm. Now in this case, 
uh, when you cube a number it ret retains its sign doesn't it so if you cube a positive number you get a positive number but if you cube a negative number you still get a negative number because a negative number negative is positive and times a negative again gives you a negative number again so again with our test values if I had 2 cubed and then I divided it by uh, negative 3 cubed that would give me uh, 8 over negative 27 which would be a negative number if I had 3 cubed divided by uh, negative 2 cubed then that would be 27 over negative 8 and that would be negative so is it always negative well this one is always going to be positive isn't it and this one is always going to be negative uh, so you're going to get a positive over a negative and that is always negative so that is never true that one because you always get a negative number 250 trains arrived at a station the number of trains that were late was recorded after every 50 trains the table shows some information about the results so we've got the number of trains um, along the top 50 100 150 200 250 and the number of late trains out of those amounts 16 21 36 38 and 55 and along the bottom we've got relative frequency calculated for two of the five values uh, then part a says complete the relative frequency graph okay now in order to complete the relative frequency graph we need to complete the table first don't we now you'll see that uh, 0 0.32, the first relative frequency there, you can get by dividing 16 by 50. That gives you 0 0.32. And 0 0.21 is 21 over 100. Uh, so the next value in that table is going to be 36 divided by 150, which comes out to be 0 0.24. Okay, and then the next one is going to be 38 divided by 200, which comes out to be 0.19. And finally, I'm going to get 55 over 250, uh, which is uh, 0.22. Okay, so now I've got all my relative frequency. Now I can plot the relative frequency graph. Okay, so we can see that the relative frequency started at 0.32. It went down to 0.21. Uh, and then at 150, it bobbed up again to 0.24, which is going to be here. Uh, note you've got 10 divisions on my graph between 0.2 and 0.3, so it's going to be four little squares up. Okay, next one, uh, I'm going to have it 200 trains. I've got a relative frequency of 0.19, so that falls down a little bit again, and then it recovers a little bit uh, for 250. It goes back up to 0.22, which is there. Okay, so I'm going to join those up with a ruler. Now with relative frequency, uh, your accuracy is going to improve as you increase the number of trials. So you do get this kind of jumping around um, as you add more and more trials. Now what should happen is that your relative frequency uh, gets closer and closer to the true value, the true um, probability of that event occurring. Okay. Um, because the more trials you have, the more data points you've got and the more accurate your result is going to be. Okay, so I would say the earlier trials are more inaccurate and the last one there, that 250 is the most accurate uh, relative frequency you have from the data because it involves the most data points. All right, now part B says write down the best estimate of the probability that a train arriving at the station is late. Oh, okay, I just kind of answered that. Didn't know that was going to be the question, uh, but it's that last one there, isn't it? The final point on the graph is the best estimate of probability. So it's going to be 0.22. A, B and C are three points in a circle. The radii from A, B and C are shown. Is A, C a diameter of the circle? You must show your working. Okay, so it's not drawn accurately, but we've got three angles given, and we need to see if uh, 5x plus 40, then this one here, resolves to 180 degrees. And if it does, 
then AC is going to be a diameter. But if that angle is not 180 degrees, then uh, it's not a diameter, is it? Okay. Now we've got three angles meeting at a point, basically. So we've got 5x plus 40, we've got x, and we've got um, this two lots of 2x plus 20. Okay. And we know that angles meeting at a point sum to 360. So angles meeting at a point sum to 360. Okay. So that means those three angles added together should be 360 degrees. So the 5x plus 40 plus the x plus the two lots of 2x plus uh, 20. So the yellow one, the green one, and the blue one added together should be 360. Okay. So let's let's um, let's try and collect everything together. Before before I do that, I'm going to have to multiply out this bracket here, aren't I? Okay. So um, so I might collect the five x and the x together. So that's six x plus forty plus I've got two lots of two x, which is four x, and I've got two lots of twenty, which is forty. So that's equal to three hundred and sixty. And then I've got my six x and the four x. And I've got 40 and 40. So adding those together, uh, and that gives me 10x plus 80 equals 360. Okay. Uh, so I've got a linear equation in x. Let's go on and solve it. Uh, let's take 80 away from both sides to start with. Uh, that will cancel. And it'll leave me with 10x on the left. 360 minus 80. Uh, that's 280, isn't it? So then if I divide both sides by 10, cancel, uh, it leaves me with x is equal to 280 divided by 10, that is 28 degrees. Okay, now I've not answered the question though, have I? The question was, is uh, the yellow angle a, a straight line? So therefore AC is, is a diameter. So if x is 28, then 5x, plus 40 then is going to be 5 lots of 28 plus 40. 5 lots of 28 is 140 plus 40 is 180. Okay, so that means that uh, a, that angle is 180 degrees, which means AC must be, therefore, AC is a diameter. A straight line has gradient 6 and passes through the point 319. Work out the equation of a line. Uh, give your answer in the form y equals mx plus c. Well, I'm actually going to start with that, y equals mx plus c. Uh, that's the general form of an equation of a straight line, isn't it? And I already know something about this straight line. I know it's got a gradient of 6, so I already know that number there. Uh, so I'm going to say, uh, let equation be... y equals 6x plus c. So then the only thing I don't know then is the c, isn't it? Uh, I do know it passes through a particular point, uh, 319. So subbing in x is 3, y is 19 into that equation. So 19 equals 6 lots of 3 plus c. Because I know those two points go together, I know that it, this equation holds for those two values. Uh, so if I sub them in, then the only thing I don't know is C, isn't it? So 19 equals 18 plus C. So taking 18 away from both sides, I can see that C must be equal to 1 then. Okay? And now I've got everything. I've got the y-intercept, which I know is, is 1, and I've got the gradient, which I know is 6. So I've got the equation of line, haven't I? Equation of line is y equals 6x plus 1. You can find more exam question compilations over here. For more past paper walkthroughs, click down here. If you want to visit my Amazon shop with my recommendations for calculators, revision guides and other maths related stuff, click down here. 
Good luck in your revision and in your exams and see you again next time.